evening. Uh, as uh, we just were talking, uh, we realized the importance of genomic characterization of organisms, and especially given that phages are uh, specially adapted to their host and their life cycle, life cycle includes short genes and uh, uh, less capacity for redundant DNA sequences and tRNA and other features. But there are not, any, there are not too many specific tools for uh, annotation of phage genomes. And even to characterize them completely, which includes the, their assembly and or predictions, assigning functions, and uh, looking at the architecture of the genome, et cetera. So we, uh, IPRC and Page directly thought that uh, given the brave, uh, given the dire importance of this area, and we understand that, you know, the genomic, genomic characterization is very important uh, to understand the phage biology and also to, uh, you know, understand when we want to apply them for any application, whether therapeutics or any other, it's important to know their genomes. So with this background, uh, IBRC and Page Directory are co-hosting a series of Page Bioinformatics webinars. And the first in the series is by Dr. Deborah jacobs Serra from Hatful Lab. Uh, from uh, Hatful Lab, whom we had earlier in June last year, we had him as a speaker. Uh, she's from Department of Biological Science, University of Pittsburgh, USA. And uh, she's a veteran in the field, actually. I don't know how many people, how many teachers and students she has trained. Uh, today, she's going to present on genomic annotation and comparative bioinformatic analysis of actinobacteriophages. She is developing, actively developing the phage discovery and genomic platform for advancing science education. She oversees program development for the FIRE program, which she'll talk about in her talk and coordinates many aspects of CFAGES program as well. Uh, uh, Debbie, as we affectionately call, everyone calls her Debbie, so I'll take that liberty to call her the same. She is spearheading methods to use a variety of actinobacterial hosts for phage isolation, which include mycobacterium, arthrobacter, microbacterium, uh, rhodococcus, and gordinia. So with this background and with this introduction, uh, may, uh, May we welcome uh, you for this first webinar of the series. And uh, without taking more time, uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much for accepting this uh, invitation. And uh, very excited. Me and Jessica both are very excited to have you. Well, it is very nice to be here. Um, I um, never met a phage I didn't like. So for me to talk about them is always um, a fun thing to do. Um, I'm going to share my, my screen and we'll go through a PowerPoint. Um, and um, I am up for questions as we go. Um, the trick is on Zoom, as you, I'm sure you know, is that it's hard to see the questions. So Jessica and Armi are going to help me and don't hesitate to slow me down or stop me with whatever you want to talk about. Okay. Um, the biggest question out there is why do we study them and how many phages are there? And um, we study them because they're there. Um, we started, um, I started with Graham Hatful over 15 years ago and I had come from a clinical background and teaching in schools. And I was very much interested in how can we do things that help others? Um, and I come to Graham Hatful's lab and he just wants to study phages because they're there. What are they and how did they get to be that way? And it really made me refocus how I think about the world um, from a basic science from versus an applied science background. And then lo and behold, in the last couple of years, we added our applied sciences to this with phage therapy. So there's lots of good reasons to look at these. Um, and there's lots of good anecdotal data out there that suggests that people use the data that we learn from these phages in lots of different ways. Um, one of the reasons we study them is because there's a lot of them. And I, every phage biologist that starts this talk always starts with how some analogy is to kind of approximate how many phages there are. Graham likes to use um, fluorescent dye, a fluorescent dye picture of DNA in seawater and approximates um, how many more phages there are than stars in the sky. Um, the, the late Roger Hendricks used to say, used to give an analogy um, to liken phages to beetles. And he used beetles because they're the most common numerous 
insect on the planet. And you would, when you approximate, um, if you make every phage a beetle, we're talking about miles and miles of beetles that cover the earth. But my favorite analogy actually comes from a, um, a, a phage biologist by the name of Costa Georgopoulos. And, and Costa says, let's try weighing them. So if you can imagine a balance beam, and if you could put all the phages on one side, what would you put on the other side to balance that, that weight? And he suggests, um, and this is where it works really well when we're all in the same room and you could look around, is if you put the entire world population on the other side, but only if we are um, sumo wrestlers. And so for some reason, my, ah, oh, there we go, there we go. Okay, so um, there's my, my silliness for the day. Okay. Um, I work in the lab of Dr. Graham Hatful and he and we study actinobacteria phages and the, the numbers of phages that we found, I just looked up this morning is we have um, over um, 18,000 phages in our collection and we've sequenced um, 3,700 of them. And um, almost all of them are by student researchers in um, a program that's situated at the University of Pittsburgh called FIRE. And the one that's all across the globe, mostly in the United States called CFAGES, where students go out right now in a two semester course um, at university and they um, take a semester and they find the phages and characterize them on the, on the plates, isolating, purifying, um, looking at restriction um, digest patterns, um, electron microscope pictures, and then sending DNA off to us where we sequence between the two semesters and second semester, they bioinformatically and, and analyze them. And students love to work in a wet lab. And then they like go, well, why am I doing this stuff at a computer? And it takes them a while to um, realize that that's where Graham does his science is at the computer analyzing and many, many bench experiments start by Graham hypothesizing what he sees in the genomes and, um, and then uh, lab work is done to um, either prove him right or prove him wrong. And like any good group of lab, um, lab scientists who work for a PI that is extremely talented is it's fun to prove him right, but it's also fun to prove him wrong. So we have a good time at all of that. Um, let me see where I'm at. Okay. So the first thing you do um, that we do that's different from lots of other ways to think about phage biology is you can just go in and get an environmental sample, um, put all the, extract the DNA out, and um, you'll see um, a sampling of what's, um, on the planet by the sample that you take. Um, that's one way to look at the biodiversity. Um, we wanna do more because once we identify and characterize a phage, we then want to be able to go back and manipulate it because that's what we do as humans is we um, understand science and we try to make sense of it, right? And then use it for our bidding. And so we archive all our samples so that we can go back and use that phage um, in whatever way the science kind of dictates to us, okay? Once we get um, the DNA extracted, we sequence. Right now, the sequencing of choice is Illumina um, because we can get good enough coverage and we have enough experience that we can finish a genome um, without additional um, technology. So uh, it's, I don't think we've done a Sanger read to finish a phage now for over a year. Um, so um, the, the, uh, the coverage is really good um, when the coverage is good um, and the quality is really good. Um, we've used, um, we started at Sanger sequencing when technology was at that point. And so we'll move wherever the technology takes us. Um, but I will say that in the actinobacteria phage hatful approach to this, we're really picky about um, how we sequence, how we finish, um, and the orientation of um, a genome. And by, by orientation, I mean um, the sequencer has no orientation. Um, if 
if it's a phage and it's circular, it's going to start it wherever it feels like and just show you that the coverage is X, Y, Z. And so it's the sequencing sequencer's job to figure out if in the phage, um, how that DNA exists in a phage head. And um, there's been lots studied by this and um, there is a correlation be between the terminase of a phage and what kind of, um, uh, of um, phage it is, meaning how are the ends determined? Is there an overlap that goes, that's a five prime overlap? Is there a three prime overlap? Does it have direct terminal repeats? Or is it circularly permuted? Meaning that no phage has the exact same um, length of DNA in it, but the unique DNA is all the same. And so you don't know where it starts and where it ends. And I wrote the, the quick, the trick question of are phage genomes circular or linear? Because in the host, um, if they're gonna take over a host, they are definitely gonna be circular or they'll be chewed up. But in the phage head, they are a linear piece of DNA. And since we report phage DNA, we want that linear piece of DNA to match what's in the phage head. And then the order of the genes in the genome um, is there for human convenience, right? That if you go back to the beginning of the genomics of phages, the best we could do is um, look at a particular gene, right? You found the capsid gene on a gel, and then you were able to sequence that. And because it was out of context of the genome, we wanted to be able to read it left to right. And so it became very common that the structural genes read left to right, and that we put those because they were the first things that we studied at the beginning of the genome. So our orientation of um, a genome is to read um, the structural genes in the forward direction. And so they end up on the left um, and in the forward direction. And if there are defined ends in a phage, um, you usually find them in a particular order. And that particular order is something like terminase, portal, um, more capsid um, processing genes like scaffolding in the protease, then the capsid genes, the tail genes, lysis cassette, um, immunity cassette, and then all the genes that mess with the host's DNA. Um, and they can be primases and polymerases and reductases, and we could go on and on and on of what you could find. And none of those genes make sense because they're not needed by the phage um, at all. The, the, the phage just needs some DNA binding sites, um, genes, and then the structural genes, and it will work. Um, what's really nice about all of this part of sequencing is that my colleague at the University of Pittsburgh, um, Dan Russell, who's in charge of our Genome Center, has written some very nice um, tutorials on finishing and orientation. And you can find them at our um, website, which is PhagesDB, in the um, resources protocol pages. The next step is annotation, which is what I'm gonna get to first. Um, and then it is coupled with step four, which is the genome comparis comparisons. Not gonna be able to go there, but the genome comparisons that we can do now actually inform how we do annotation. Um, and it helps us to refine um, lots, and st lots of steps, okay? Um, in genome annotation, the big overarching rules are, is if we could do this by annotation um, through automation, we would. Um, we don't because the phages don't follow the rules um, and they're so small and their genes are so small, it becomes difficult to um, assert um, the programming parameters. And when we're done, we're gonna compare with everything else that we see as I just described, sorry, okay. The skills of bioinformatics, I believe, are really skills that you've learned when you were um, we, a wee child. And um, I contend that the skill that's needed for genome annotation is the skill of pattern recognition. 
And I use this reading readiness test to test folks to say, if you have this skill, you can do genome annotation. And um, you can all figure out where in the fourth box you would put the, the dot. Is that true? I'm gonna take a yes. Okay. Um, and so you all have the skills that you need to do this. Okay. The second key concept is um, that because we are in the bioinformatics um, world, um, it is gonna feel very uncomfortable. Um, in, in the true sense of biology, if we could take every gene to the bench and study it, characterize it, find out what it does and how it interacts with all the other genes, it would be a perfect world. Um, we don't wanna forsake the good for the perfect. And so we're going to use um, analogous, homologous, um, everything we can, we're gonna throw at these phages to infer as much as we can. We are going to do what every good science does, scientist does and make a claim, look for some, data, some supporting data before we wanna um, make the claim, right? We're gonna, we're gonna identify a question and then we're either gonna say yes or no and assign this as a gene and what its function is. It's gonna feel very uncomfortable. I work with very young people and this feels really um, uncomfortable and they get really skittish and then they start to think, what does it matter? Like it, it's, it's make-believe. It's not make-believe, it's just putative, okay? And we're gonna use supporting data to, um, to identify um, those parts of the genome that we care about. Um, we're gonna use Glimmer and GeneMark for their, their predictive um, powers to predict coding potential. Um, they use interpolated hidden Markov models. They look at four nucleotides at a time, um, they even have a series where they can look at two nucleotides at a time, but that gets pretty noisy and should be pretty much discounted. Um, and that um, both of those programs claim somewhere over 95% accurate. Unfortunately, 95% accurate is not good enough. And so we actually curate these all by hand um, and no one really assigns functions in um, a consistent and meaningful way. Um, but all pieces of data are helpful as we um, move forward. This is slide number nine, I think in my PowerPoint, and it is the important slide. If you take home anything, this is the one that you wanna, you wanna grab because it has all the links of all the programs that I'm gonna talk about. First and foremost is our bioinformatics guide and um, Actually, how you get down and do the work is all, and how you use these programs is all written in this bioinformatic guide. And um, if you really want to learn how to annotate a phage from my perspective, um, this is the place that you go and you get very familiar with it. Um, or you use it as a resource, jump in, and then go back and use it as a reference. Like I said, we're going to use the prediction programs of GeneMark and Glimmer. Um, we're going to use Aragorn and tRNA, and they're both online. Um, and tRNA scan in particular can be downloaded on your own server and you can run it independently, which might be smart because it's a little bit finicky. Um, we're going to use blasts um, both at the nucleotide level and the protein level um, in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of information in blast data and the conserved domain database, and there are ways you read the data for the question that you bring. So if you keep in mind when you're annotating that you have a question, is this a gene? What does it start? What is its function? And you use the data to answer each one of those questions specifically, you'll be very successful at that. If you are in the actinobacteriophage data, um, we also have a database, database that is blastable. And so if you've used NCBI, it takes um, some time to do your blasting. Phages DB is much quicker and you're gonna match the same first 100 hits because we have so much data um, at NCBI. One of the programs that we use that is um, essential um, and can be used by anyone else by contacting the 
um, creator of it is Famerator. And if you've ever um, looked at a sing any um, paper by Graham Hatful um, where we are describing a new set of phages, we have these wonderful genome maps. And they're really pretty, and that's who makes them is the Famerator program. But more importantly, um, it is a pairwise comparison at both the protein and nucleotide level and gives you lots of comparative genome data that you can then um, build upon and um, finely tune what you're looking at. And then the key program that we use um, for um, genome annotation is a program written by University of Pittsburgh um, researcher by the name of Jeffrey Lawrence, and it's called DNA Master. And DNA Master is a genome editor. And most programs that let you interact with um, um, DNA and genomes are actually viewers. And so when you go in and you try to change things in them, um, it gets really tricky. DNA Master has this wonderful feature where it links everything you touch um, with the actual sequence. So you can manipulate it and um, interact with it in a way that ends up being very productive. And I wrote another um, favorite tool that's in DNA Master called Genome Comparison that um, will let you compare genomes very quickly. Um, and as you change them, it'll show you the changes on the spot um, because all other programs are much more fixed. Okay. Um, our genome annotation is um, de described in the bioinformatics guide. And um, I'm having a heck of a time advancing my slides, guys. So it's, it's strange, sorry. Um, and in that guide is our three beautiful pages of um, what we do to um, annotate. Um, and they look like this. And there's a lot of boxes and a lot of words and we do all of this. Um, and I could not cover all of this in an hour, but I want you to know that um, this is what we do and it is really all spelled out and gives you clear um, information on um, how we come to the decisions that we make, okay? Um, we start every annotation with um, a FASTA file. And um, I told you at the beginning, the skill you need to be able to make sense of this is to find patterns. And lo and behold, uh, many, many decades ago, people would look at this sequence and be able to find things in it. If you looked really hard, you could find starts, you could find stops, and then you would be able to um, make some sense of it. Thank goodness today we have lots of programs that can do that for us um, and we try. Um, and we do that by converting the nucleotide sequence to genes and we do that by codons and um, we use for the most part, though not exclusively, because there's um, phages that don't use the bacterial and plant plastic code, um, but we do, um, and it seems to work. Um, and what is unique to students is they know about um, the methionine start, but they don't know about the GTG and the TTG start. Um, it takes me a while sometimes to remember what the stop codons are because they're represented as asterisks in my um, data. And so um, I really have to work sometimes at the stops. Um, the space in between, a start and a stop, is called an open reading frame. And then the programs work to find the coding potential um, in all of the ORFs that are present. Um, know that for every sequence given, there are um, there's more than one way to translate it into codons, and you know this. Um, and so if we start with the letter A, we get a, a series of codons. If we start with the second letter, we get another series. If we start with the third letter, we get another set of um, amino acids in a codon. We know that um, if we start with the fourth letter, we're back into the first row, right? 
we're back to this one. We just skipped the ATG, right? And we know that the DNA in our FASTA file is just one of two um, sequences. Um, and so um, we know that there's a, um, an anti-parallel strand that also codes. So there's three more ways to code it. So there are six reading frame translations um, for every DNA sequence. And if we really wanna look for it and study it, we can get in and do this. And DNA Master has a way of generating this exact document of a whole genome. Um, when Graham um, annotates, he looks at this all the time and he can readily see, um, see the promoter sequences and um, he's really good at finding um, like hairpin terminators and things like that. Um, for the most part, unless I know I wanna look for them, I really don't. Um, but DNA Master displays the sequence in a way that you can um, find where you are at all times. The features found um, in actinobacteriophage genomes include our protein coding sequence, which is the majority of the features we find. We find tRNAs, tmRNAs. Um, we can identify at P sites. Um, we can identify terminators. We don't normally um, find and annotate them in our GenBank files. Um, that usually happens when we've really dug in deep with particular sets of genomes and we really wanna know more about it and it's usually written in a paper. Um, one of the things that we routinely look for and annotate is the tail assembly chaperone program frame shift. Um, and um, it is one of the fun things I think that we annotate because it really shows an interesting feature of how genes are translated. Um, and we won't really deal with that on this talk because it's way down the road from the basics. There are three questions we ask about every gene feature. And is it a gene? What is its start? And what is its function? Um, so an average genome in the actinobacteriophages is about a 70 KB strand, and there's usually around 100 genes. So we're going to ask each of those questions 100 times. Okay. What is most critical is we make the claim of is it a gene, what is its start, and what is its function is that we have supporting data. Um, we're not making it up. And um, we use the coding potential programs and a lot of comparative data to um, help us get to the answers. DNA Master is excellent at helping us to add genes, delete genes, and to change the start um, with very little um, trouble. Okay. Um, the coding potential is done. And the, the most important thing about this slide is that you take your phage genome and you take it out to these to the website of GeneMark. Glimmer is um, downloadable and Glimmer presents you with a list of starts and stops. GeneMark actually presents, um, one of its outputs is a graphic output that's really good for when you're working with students to get them to see where the genes are and how they fit together. You just have to remember at all times that both programs only use a sample of the genome. So they, it's a random sample and it looks for the biggest open reading frames and it looks for um, codon, no, not codon usage, but display of four nucleotides at, the time, at a time. It's easy to um, sort of approximate that to codon usage, um, even though it's not. Um, it looks at four nucleotides at a time and says, what's the prevailing patterns that are there? That must be where um, the genes are. And that works really well, unless the genes are from a different source than what you gave it to model after. So if, it, if they're newly acquired genes, their coding pattern could be really different than the rest of that phage genome. If you point to a host, um, maybe the host you uh, isolated on, if it's in GeneMark's repertoire, or a genome of the same um, genus, you just have to remember that doesn't mean that that phage infects that host, um, but does it give you information um, that you can use to make good decisions? Um, sure. Um, it's always fun, I think, to 
go out to GeneMark's website and use their program and compare the coding potential. If it's a phage found on Mycobacterium smegmatis, find the, the coding potential um, compared to smeg versus E. coli. Um, and you will quickly see um, garbage in, garbage out. Um, you'll see that anything could be called a gene depending on the parameters that you use um, to evaluate it. And um, it's important that you understand that these are predictive, they're, they're programs that help you predict what's there and that you can cipher through it all. The next three slides are also in the guide and there are guiding principles of bacteriophage um, genome annotation. And um, uh, they're there for you to read. There's some highlights I wanna pick up. First is that um, in any part of the DNA, we only think there's one gene. So they're not gonna be on top of each other for the most part. Um, they also don't overlap each other very much, um, except for the quintessential beautiful three or, or four or one base pair overlap that actually the ribosome would prefer. Um, and so this gets into the question of um, where does translation, transcription, where does it all start, right? And in the simplest form, a bacteriophage genome um, has two jobs. One is to go in and take over the host, and the other is to make parts of a phage and assemble them and spit out phage. Um, and so you could think about a phage genome as being two operons to do that. Um, what we found in the limited bench data we have is that there's a couple more than that. Um, there can be um, promoters in the area of the repressor. So if it's going to integrate, this will help regulate how it, reg um, how it does that. And there can be promoters like around the capsid because it's going to make a whole lot more capsid genes than it's going to make um, some of the other genes that it makes. So, um, and there's no one way to do this, right? So there are a couple places and that's becoming more apparent as we do more RNA-seq data. Um, but for now, um, you could simplify it. And we do have genes in the Arthrobacter, I know, and I'm pretty sure in the Microbacteria that are like in the neighborhood of 15 KB. And they're all structural genes with a little handful of DNA binding genes at the end. So that's exactly what they're doing. They're, they're grabbing on to the host machinery, the host DNA, taking over its machinery and making phages. Um, so it's exactly what, when I first began to study these phages, what I thought all a phage needed. However, most phages have you know, 40 genes that are all in DNA regulation and what they're doing and how they help or hinder the phage or the bacteria is complicated and complex. Okay. The gene density in phage genomes is that it's very high. Um, and this gets really tricky because if we just make it dense, um, we're doing a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so we try really hard to make sure we have evidence for every gene that we call, but we do find that they are, um, that there's very few gaps. In the instances where there are gaps, we aggressively look for what could be in that gap, but don't aggressively fill it if there's no evidence for anything there. So there are occasions where we have phages that have one or two KB, which is huge in a phage genome, where there's no genes or anything that we can um, recognize like a tRNA um, or whatever present doesn't mean there isn't something useful there. We just don't know what it is. Um, one of the strongest um, rules that we follow is that we're not gonna cut off coding potential. Um, and this gets really interesting when we um, have students do it because the Shine Del Garnos and start, start um, the ribosome binding site data is numerical. 
and folks want to use um, big numbers. Um, but the only um, ribosome binding data that is really pertinent is one that includes all of the coding potential. And you would be surprised when you compare um, the gene mark data trained on self to the gene mark data trained on a host, how they can inform you. And um, it, it, there's some nuances in there that with practice you begin to appreciate. Um, most, many phage genes are unique. You won't find them anywhere in the literature. And if you find them somewhere else, um, they don't know what it is either. So about 30% of our phage genes um, have functions, which is way high from when I started. Um, but just because you don't know what it does doesn't mean you don't call it. Um, and that's uncomfortable. Um, and uncomfortable for some more than others, but I'm going to encourage you to call what is there. Um, you also have to remember that there are genes and genomes that do not follow the patterns you begin to identify. Um, the notorious gene that comes to mind is an HNH endonuclease, right? It's capable of popping in and popping out of genomes. Um, what feels like willy-nilly. And so it can have a way different coding potential than the rest of the genome because it's newly acquired. And so you have to be willing to um, look for that, search for it, and um, find evidence to support that. Phages try their best to be efficient. Um, Remember, they don't have the ability to produce energy. So anything that requires energy is going to be tricky for a phage, I think. And so um, you want to be careful that you don't um, decorate a phage genome by calling a forward gene reverse gene, a forward gene reverse gene, a forward gene reverse gene. It doesn't really work like that. Um, because we're going to need, the phage is going to need promoters and ways to get um, the, each of those genes started if they're like all by themselves going in a direction. Much more efficient that, that the whole genome be in one direction and it could go in one swoop or in two directions and have two different um, initiating um, machinery along the way. Um, it calls, the number eight is called into question all the time. Um, that, you know, historically the smallest protein was about 40 amino acids. I think we've broken that record. Um, it were much smaller than that. And we're finding that those little tiny genes are things that actually um, do, do battle or provide um, added utility to a bacteria. Um, and so, um, We've studied some of those things and found that they are critical in how well a phage um, survives um, with a host. Okay. Um, number 10, I now just learned recently that that can be broken, but for the most part, you have to have a stop codon. The stop codon, when you're learning to annotate, is the only unique feature. Um, to identify a phage by. Um, lots of people call genes and then you start adding genes and subtracting genes. So if you call them by name, like as in numbers, um, we typically identify our genes in each genome starting at one and going as many genes as we have. Um, but if you start to delete and add, you can mess that number. Remember that the prediction programs um, can start with a random sample. So they may not have um, and where they break down are in the small genes. So um, what may be um, gene number 42 in one file isn't 42 in another file. And when you're trying to do this in a classroom, that becomes really um, treacherous. And the simplest way to figure out what everybody's talking about is to identify the stop codon because it's the only thing that is unique in that particular open reading frame because you could all be talking about different starts. Um, there are three start codons in our um, codon usage, and they are ATG, DG, GTG, and TTG. Um, TTG is only a, 
um, used, it's an infrequent um, usage. Um, when we've calculated, which has been some time ago, we're at about 7% of the genes start with TTGs. Um, they end up being evaluated a little bit more strongly because they're sort of forgotten in the programs that we use. Um, if you notice, I have a number 12 there and I took it out of the main list and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, TNR, tRNAs are, um, are, why are they in a phage genome? <laughs> why does it need a tRNA? It shouldn't need one. It's gonna use the host and the host better have it or the host isn't going um, to be present. So, um, they're there. We try to pay special attention. We have a graduate student in the lab who's working on getting some answers to tRNAs. It seems to be a hot topic. I've seen to have gotten um, a couple requests lately because people are starting to, they're starting to gain traction in, in investigation. Um, and we're picky and we're trying to um, call them as precisely as we can. And so we spend a little bit of extra time in how we do that. Um, protein assignments are um, unbelievably rigorous. Um, we want data. You will find in our data set that for a while we were calling a lot of things based on Synteny. Um, for the last three years, we've tried to um, revamp that and like kind of pull back a little bit. Um, the only gene, gene now that I'm calling by Synteny, meaning where it's located in the genome, are those big genes right after the tape measured gene um, that have to be minor tails. Everything else I'm a little bit squeamish um, to call um, um, by where it's located in the genome if it doesn't have some sort of supporting data and that supporting data most often comes from HHPRED. Um, BLAST you have to be careful of because BLAST is like somebody said it was that. Um, so you're going to want to go into using the conserved domain database in the NCBI BLAST and make sure where that data came from. I, I think that's basically the rule here is that um, you really want to make sure that um, you have some sort of data to back up whatever you want to claim. Um, and then um, iteration, the more you do it, the more, the better you get at it, the more you're um, willing to um, make your claims and you know where to look for the data. Um, all the databases can be very intimidating and it takes a while till you get acclimated and, um, uh, and get there. Um, this is number 12 and um, it's the longest of all of the um, guiding principles and it's the least useful. And the reason it's the least useful is it talks about shindo garno sequences and getting a genome to be um, hooked into the ribosome or a transcript to get hooked into the ribosome so it can be translated. And it is a very known um, understood kind of phenomenon, but a lot of the transcripts are leaderless um, in our phages, and so it's irrelevant. And, um, and so I just don't wanna go there. Um, my next picture is a picture of DNA master with a phage open. Um, and um, if there's enough time, I'll show you how I got here. But basically I did what we call an auto annotation. We took our phage genome out to Glimmer and GeneMark um, and Aragorn 1.0 and processed it. And it came back and he said, here's the predictive genes. Um, and it comes back in a list, right, which is right here um, in the feature table. It tells me um, how it was called by Glimmer and GeneMark, and there's a shorthand for what this all means. And I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to explain that very well, but it's in a list. But this is the place. This frames window is the place where DNA Master um, outperforms any other program I've tried to use. Because for every single row in this table, there is a gene feature that's listed. You can see there are six rows. So all six translations are represented here and where these genes are in, um, in those six frames are represented. This lets you know where all the starts are and it, knows, it shows you very quickly the relationship of one gene to the other. 
And if they're tightly packed, you can see these genes are pretty tightly packed. Here's one to investigate because is this the right start or should be it be made bigger? And um, I, we'll look at all starts, but that's a, a, a key to saying what would be better. And DNA Master has the tools to help you evaluate that um, quite simply. Um, the green are forwards, the reverses are reds in my um, version. Um, there's a color chart and you can make them any color you want. And so that gets to be kind of fun, um, but this is where the work is done. Um, it allows you to blast all the genomes, the genes in the genome. You can blast the whole genome at one time. Um, it's a rather tedious and long process because you're interfacing with NCBI. DNA Master is a program that requires administrative access. So you have to run this program as an administrator so that basically it can talk to other programs that are out on the web. And that gets problematic depending on what kind of computer you have and um, what kind of privileges you have. Um, if you're in an institution with lots of firewalls, you're gonna have to get clearance of all those things. Um, there are preferences that are set in DNA Master. DNA Master is easily downloaded from Jeffrey Lawrence's website. The install program installs one of the most early versions of DNA Master that no longer works. The second thing you have to do with DNA Master is update it. If you don't have administrative privileges, you can't update it because you can't get your computer to talk to Jeffrey's computers. And so um, that's your first clue as to how easy this is gonna go. Um, in our guide, we have you have to set up the preferences in a particular way or things don't work. And nine times out of 10, those are the two things that happen where we get messages from our student population and faculty population that says, this isn't working, why is that? However, once you get it working, you begin to see how easily you can manipulate um, the genomic data and get your answers quickly and efficiently. Um, that particular um, visual representation um, mimics the gene mark output that again shows you six reading frames. Um, it shows you each open reading frame. If you can see these lines that bisect each row. So here's a good example of an open reading frame. Up ticks or starts, down ticks or stops. The coding potential is um, outlined with this back black line. The red lines are using an algorithm that looks at two nucleotides at a time, and I just consider it noise. I pay no mind to any of the red lines. And then the black heavy line at the bottom is actually what GeneMark has identified an area of interest. May not even be any, um, anything they really call, um, because they may call other things. And here's a really good example of some really what looks like crappy coding potential that should be investigated um, to see if you're looking for it. My guess is neither Glimmer or GeneMark really called this guy. And I'll put my money right now on that I'm gonna wanna call this guy because there's enough coding potential and it may be something significant. And I won't know that until I investigate. The Famorator map, um, is found at famorator.org. Again, that link is on um, slide nine. And it shows you, this is two rows of two phages called Zizzle and Lomula. Um, the names are fun because um, we allow the finders to, find, to name, the phage, um, name the phages because when you find the phage, you have to give it a name because if you don't, with thousands of phages found, you could never keep everything straight. We believe in a non-systematic nomenclature, um, meaning you do not anything about your phage um, in its relationship to other phages by where you found it, when you found it, um, and what a plaque looks like. Uh, all the plaques um, can look the same and different, and um, it, there's no key um, component characterization that gives it something nameable. In addition, um, all of the phages in the actinobacteria phage so far, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that back. Most of the phages in our groups are um, 
called a vir viral in nature. So there's siphovirides, myovirides, and podovirides. And so you can't put all the siphos together. They're, they're too diverse. Um, nor can you put all the myos or podos. We just don't have as many of those and I don't have as much to say. Um, but this is two rows of these two phages and you will see a ruler, which signifies the genome um, length um, and is a representation of the nucleotides. And then there's boxes above and below that line. The boxes above are genes that are predicted that um, are going in the forward direction and the ones below are in the reverse direction, okay? The boxes are color-coded and numbered, and I'm sure you can't read the numbers, but just because they're the same color doesn't mean they're the same thing because there's tens, 15,000 different groups, what we call FAMs of genes, and there's not enough colors to really tell them apart. So always check your, your numbers, um, but the, there's a number above the box that is the FAM number, and how many members are in it. And I think the how many members is what's really important there. FAM numbers change every time we generate a new FAMerator database. And in our busy season, we're doing that once a week. Um, however, we can connect them all. And so it isn't, um, it, the data is retrievable. Um, the other thing shown on this map are as, as we finish a genome and little, little moolah, is finished, but Zizzle is just a draft. We add the functions in. So when we're calling Zizzle, we know that this is the terminase um, large sum unit. We're gonna prove it by looking at all of our data, but it gives us an idea of the orientation and what we can find. The biggest gene is almost always a tape measure gene. It's a gene that's involved in tail assembly chaperone. Its length is correlated to the length of the tail. And so, um, it's a good um, kind of benchmark of a phage genome. And um, the other thing that this map shows is that it is a pairwise comparison, and I've only given it a pair, um, but there's the colors in between um, the two genomes. And those colors are um, a representation of nucleotide similarity, and the colors go the colors of the rainbow with um, violet being the most similar, white being no similarity. And in the case of um, white, you can sometimes see that things can still be in the same um, family and I don't really see a good example of that. Um, but there's lots of things you can learn by using Famerator. And Famerator is very interactive and you can move the genomes around and there's lots to be gained. If you are studying phages outside of actinobacteria phages, um, Steve Crisson at James Madison University is the owner of Famerator um, and is willing to set up databases um, um, with just about anybody. So he is a good person to um, have as a resource. And then the bottom line comes into um, the first genome we find that's like unique. Um, we call them singletons at this stage of the game. Um, you have very little comparative data to which to rely on, but as the comparative data comes in, we get to be able to refine um, the data more and more and more. Um, we have a program, and again, it's, um, it's in you know free resource and you can set it up yourselves, is it's a starter rater and it takes every gene that shares a FAM and shows you where all the starts are um, so that you can really come to a consensus rather quickly. Um, when you use DNA Master, know that this was written by Jeffrey Lawrence, I think close to 20 years ago, um, and that you should still consider it a beta testing. It's written in a language called Delphi, which is defunct now, um, and that it's very easy to corrupt and lose your work. So um, you need to know that you have to run it as an administrator. You have to save often. Every time you save, you should save it as a new name never overwriting the last data that you know was good, because if you overwrite corrupt with, um, overwrite a good file with corrupt work, you're gonna have to redo it all. And um, it works very nicely um, in a virtual machine. And um, uh, we have a, um, 
our virtual machine of preference, and you can use whatever you want, is um, VirtualBox because it's free. And um, that's what I use. Um, there's other choices out there. Um, there's also, uh, I don't know if I'm going to say this correctly, but emulators like Wine, where you can run Windows programs on, um, on Macs. And I would discourage you from doing that because it loses functionality and um, it runs so slowly, it can be extremely painful. And then I added the reminder is, did you save your files again using a new name? Because if you lose your work, you will cry. And you can imagine that I have cried many, many times <laughs> as I have done this work. Um, and that's the way it goes. So that's the overview of how you get started. If you're interested in using our programs, um, like I said, go to slide nine, read the bioinformatics guide. Um, our CFAGES program sponsored by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, all, we also have another website called cfages.org. And um, again, there's a lot of public facing information there, including forums that if you know your question, um, you can, the search function is likely to get you to um, other folks who have had the same problem and then you can get to an answer. Um, so um, I would say that like all the programs used for phages, um, we're trying really hard to be user-friendly, um, but it's hard. And um, the data is coming at us really, really fast and trying to make sense of that data and then to get to the answers that we'd really like to get to um, isn't, isn't easy. And um, for those of you who are young enough and um, sturdy enough, um, start programming. <laughs> um, because the answers, the questions that you will be able to ask and get answers for are gonna be found in big data sets. And phages make good use of, um, uh, of that data. And by all means, try to do that. Um, I think I might have a couple minutes for questions if you're, uh, if you'd like to ask them. Definitely, Debbie, thank you so much. There are so many questions, raised hands. And before I take questions, uh, there are, there's, there, there's requests from several people if we can share the slides with them. Um, I yes, I gave them to you. Will you share them? Is that okay? Okay, I'll do that. Wonderful. So that's a good news for all of you. Jessica, you want to take the question? I mean, you want to ask the questions? Sure. Yep. Um, are we going a little bit after the hour or what, what's our time frame just before we get going? We can go right after. Right, right. Sorry, what was that? We can go right now, right away. But how many, how much time should we spend? I think there are about uh, 10 questions as I can okay. see. No. We'll just and do so the two hands are raised, so maybe they are very eager to talk, so maybe we can have them speak first. Uh, Nitish wants to, uh, Nitish and Nimar. Okay. I will ask Nitish to unmute, sorry. Okay, you should be able to. Yeah, hello. Yeah, am I audible? Yeah. yeah. So I have very um, like basic question about what degree of exchanges in the genomes that you you find between phages and their hosts. And uh, the follow-up question is, um, when you pair up phages and hosts, do you see any kind of a relationship with respect to their environment? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, and I'm not sure I heard the first question. Could you tell me the first question again? Sorry. Yeah, uh, so the first question is, uh, what degree of Changes in the genome, uh, do you happen to see between phages and the host? Um, so um, that's hard to say, right? Because um, is it, it's not easy to say. Um, the place where you kind of see it is where um, in the area around the integrase. And so where the phage attaches to the host, it can sometimes drag things that are very foreign and um, not easy to understand from the host. Um, 
it, are the tRNAs? Like, I, I don't know how to answer most of the question in that um, is a polymerase from the host because the phage doesn't need a polymerase. So it had to have come from the host. Um, why does a phage bring its own polymerase? Um, I don't know that answer either because it doesn't technically need it but does it make it more advantageous to the host? No, to the phage. Maybe being able to get in and out of a, a host quickly is, is, you know, maybe it's a time. I have no idea. Um, what you also see is that sometimes you find a phage on a, on a host that it's the first time, I don't know that it is exactly the first time, but it hasn't been in that host very long. So it doesn't match anything about the host that we know a lot of. Um, the same kinds of genes are consistently found, even if we don't know what they are, we can see them over and over again. Um, and so you're asking me a question that would be great to be able to answer, but I don't have an answer. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. okay, we'll go with Nimat next. I'm gonna ask you to unmute Nimat. There, you should be able to. Okay, um, I'm gonna go with Rodrigo then next, but Nimat, if you if you want to after him, you can. So bear with us while we work on the special security measures. I'm clicking ask to unmute, but Rodrigo, yep, yeah, there you go. Hello, Deborah, thank you for the talk. Sure. I was just wondering, um, the program, can it identify phage satellites, for example? Um, well, it would depend on what you gave it, right? Um, yeah. Um, no, I, I don't think... Um, you would have to suspect strongly that you have satellites. And then once you put it into DNA Master, it would help you to easily identify what the genes are, and then you would go source out what what genes are there and you would have to come to that conclusion. Um, yeah. when, you, when you have a big data set, like a bacterial genome or whatever comes in a whole sh genome shotgun sequencing project, yeah. um, you're still your best bet for finding phage-like items are the, the programs like FASTER um, and things like that, um, which are clumsy and difficult yeah. and um, we're that's working actually, on it. That's actually one of the biggest problems at the moment because we know and we have sequences of phage satellites and sometimes we try to obviously identify what the coding regions are doing because these will carry all the things. Some of them are picked up, you know, as NCBI and the other platforms. But when you try to run them through FASTER, for example, FASTER will simply not give you an output because I think there's like a limitation Right. with like the recognition of like conserved regions, for example. So normally they don't carry capsid and therefore faster doesn't give me anything, despite of me already knowing this is clearly a phage satellite because we've worked with it, blah, blah, blah. Right, no, it, so um, one of the programs that's in our repertoire is um, a program that basically collects um, all the database information in one place. So it will take your um, gene mark and glimmer output, right? So um, DNA master could help you refine what you think are genes, but then getting it blasted and HH predated, and does it have any membranes, pro protein, you know, whatever, whatever you're interested in um, is how do you collect that all so that you're not running your hundred things in a hundred different programs, right? Yeah. Um, and um, and so I think that helps um, with that. But right now, the only way to get at that is to probably HH pred and set up your databases that you can blast against. Yeah, um, we do all the all the stuff manually. <laughs> and right, and it feels very manual and very difficult. Yeah. Um, right, we we need someone with a lot of money and a big um, computing system to. Um, start housing this data that is the most prolific data um, of the planet. What um, kinds of phages are you looking at? Like, what's the host? Where where are so you at? 
we normally look at E. coli, uh, Staphylococcus, Listeria, Enterococcus, because we know there that, you know, we have studied these phage satellites there. Right. Uh, but it's clearly what we've seen from other data sets is that there's more out there. Like oh, many, many things have been recognized as, you know, defective prophages and these type of things that also a lot of these phage satellites were initially thought as, oh, these are defective. And it turned out it's not the case. Right. Right. So, uh, so much, so much yeah. to do. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So Nimat, would you like to answer, ask your question? Nimat has thanked, basically is thanking. He's written a message. So okay. he's just uh, congratulating uh, the organizers and thanking Debbie very much for an excellent talk. And several of them have, are doing this. So maybe now we can have questions from the text or Dr. Sanji, are you there? Sanji yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Umi. Um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Deborah. Uh, it was very nice, uh, informative talk. I just want your um, uh, comment on your, or, or your recommendation regarding the smart experimental verification of your annotation, particularly with respect to say proteogenomics approach to verify uh, your annotation? Uh, um, so, um, are you asking about our quality control procedures? Is that what you're really asking? Like, how do we know what we're doing? Is yeah, experimental verification. If I want to check whether my um, annotation, how good that is. So what are the smart experimental protocols or experimental uh, experiments you would recommend? Um, um, for example, proteogenomics is becoming popular nowadays for annotating genes. Um, um, I don't really have good recommendations because we're at the beginning of this. Um, so I don't really know. Um, and that's my simplest answer. <laughs> um, there's a lot of insight into that. Um, at this stage of the game, um, we are trying to document what we're doing in a very um, human way. Um, in our one of our databases called CFages, we have forums and we try to write specific things like that um, as a resource, but we have not connected that to any of our reporting. So we have not tried to use a system that would document that we know this is a capsid from an experimental um, position. Um, we just we just aren't there yet. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So should we ask some questions from the chat? I will ask the first one. Um, so okay, aren't the genes in T four like phages arranged by their temporal expression during the life cycle? Um, I don't know enough to know the answer to that. Um, cause I really work in the actinobacteria phage. Um, so, um, um, we, we reference T4 a lot, but I don't, I don't know enough about T4 to answer that question. Well, sorry. Um, let's go with another one. Have you tried nanopore sequencing in phages? Um, we do have a nanopore sequencer and, um, it is not getting us to the finished state that the Illumina is. And so right now we're sticking with Illumina, um, but we are using the nanopore for our bacterial phase, bacterial sequencing. And that seems to be working well too, um, right? The whole sequencing arena keeps changing. And I, I'm gonna say, no matter what we say today, um, like look for what we're gonna do tomorrow. <laughs> Which is the appropriate E value for digging protein homology when using HHPRED or other tools? Ah, oh, that's a that's a lovely question. Um, I think we look at a ten to the minus three to get some sort of answer, um, but that's out of context. Like there isn't a net. Like you won't find that number in our protocols because if e you find something, you know, we can hit human proteins at 10 to the minus three, right? Um, there are no human proteins 
in a phage. Mm -hmm. There just aren't. Are there homologs that do something different for a phage that end up to be somehow related to it? Sure. Um, the one that comes to mind is um, um, every once in a while we hit a von Willebrand's factor, but it, it's because it has a DNA binding sequence that, that is a homologous, but it's not a clotting factor. It has no clotting ability. So um, it, you just have to be careful of, of it. Um, if you use HHPRED to assign function, I don't really use the E value when I'm looking at HHPRED. HHPRED actually points you to their um, percent identity and how similar it is. And we use a cutoff there of 90%. Um, again, it has to make sense for the phage to do that. Um, and the other part of assigning function is definitely how much identity you have across or similarity you have across the whole thing you give it. Um, and there are times where it doesn't have to have a, a whole long significance. Um, a good example would be that it has some sort of peptidoglycan domain and it's the biggest gene in the genome and it's where the tape measure should be. It's the tape measure, even though it's the first time we've ever seen that particular kind of tape measure. Um, and so one of the things I hope you'll all take away from this is if we could throw all this data in a, in a computer and set up parameters and say, if it, if it hits you know, um, a 90% alignment with a 90% hit, give it that function, I'm pretty sure um, we would do that. But you can't, like it just has to all be done in context. And you know, these phages are so diverse. Um, it's all good stuff. And, the challenge is there and it's a puzzle and it's a really fun puzzle. Awesome. Um, do we know what setup is used by DNA Master to execute gene mark and glimmer in the background? Um, so this is out of my area of expertise. I just know the person who has it set up. Um, it is set up via um, DNA Master has to establish the link and then it's according to like Glimmer and Gene Marks downloadable executables, right? And it literally is, there's a link to get to them. Um, and I honestly don't know if you're gonna do it independently. Um, I assume that's an email to Jeffrey Lawrence and saying, hey, I wanna use DNA Master. You know, this is the link to where my Glimmer is. This is where my, the link where my Gene Mark is. And, um, I, and I, you know, there, there are windows that let you point to wherever it needs to be pointed to. Um, I'm not even sure if you'd need to ask him, but that's what I would do. Cool. Um, how can one transform a FASTA file to EMBL file to make it easily readable with Artemis software? Ah, so DNA Master is excellent at um, changing its formats. Um, and so you start um, with a FASTA file, but then DNA master makes its own um, um, database file called a, um, I always call it a dyslexic, a dyslexic DAM file because it's DNAM, but I really read the word DAM every time. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> but it will, um, it can reformat into um, things. I'm pretty sure there's an EMBL file, but there's definitely um, FASTA files and um, other files that um, uh, can go into other programs. He's made it so that it will, um, you, you can take the data out just as easily as put it in. Great. Um, can we find mycobacterial phage promoters with any tool available? Um, sure. So there's wonderful search functions in DNA Master. It's one of its um, not introductory points that I just couldn't get to in an hour, um, but there's a search function. If you know what your promoter sequence that you wanna um, point to, it will search the whole genomes for those sequences. It will look for promoters and score them. Um, exactly how, you know, how far you wanna believe it will depend on 
your usage of it, I think, and how, you know, when you compare that to things you really do know, um, you'll have to establish your cutoffs of what scores work. But yeah, you can find your, you can find, you can easily find promoters in a sequence that you give it. Um, Jeffrey claims that you can import all of NCBI into DNA Master if you have a computer big enough to hold the data. Um, and it has what it calls a genome manager and will actually hold all the files and let you do a lot of comparative work. So there's lots of things that can be done. Um, there's a scan function that Graham is actually fond of, that if you know a sequence that you really want to find, um, it's better at finding it than most. Mostly for the simple fact is you can put it in in the forward direction and it will find it in both directions, um, which you know a lot of times we get tripped up because we're looking for something in a sequence that's really going in the opposite direction as us. Um, and that can be painful. Awesome. Yeah, uh, it really is a really good program. It's just um, falling. It's not falling apart. It's working fine. You just have to be very careful and know the limitations and you have to have a good computer to work with it. Um, and more than likely, the newer versions of Windows are going to become less and less compatible. So, you know, us Mac users, we use it on a virtual machine. Um, the PC folks are also going to end up installing a virtual machine on your PC so that you can run an old operating system. We say we're we're pointed to getting this updated. Um, and the last time I checked with each of us all only having two hands, it's it's it has to happen. One day this isn't going to work, but right now we're holding on as best we can. <clears throat> um, out of the six reading frame translations, how do you know which is the correct one? Um, so that's where coding potential comes in, um, is that those programs use math, right? And they look at the code on usage. I, I don't want to say code on usage, the nucleotide patterns um, and figure out which ones are most likely based on the biggest open reading frames. So the general concept is, is that if you have a really big open reading frame, I'll bet right now we probably know its function, okay? But even if we didn't, it can't stay a big open reading frame. It will degenerate if it's not used by the phage, right? And if it degenerates, it will become smaller and smaller and smaller and be useless. But if it stays big over time, it has to be something that the phage makes. And so it uses that to say, if you are made like that thing's made, then that's the simplest, most efficient way for a phage to make all the things it makes. Does that make sense? And so um, that's basically the concept behind the math that both Glimmer and GeneMark use. And then they also use um, start, start sequences and other things to refine it and that data comes back in less than a minute and you go, I don't know how they came to it, but it, it truly is a math on a sample that includes the biggest orbs. And what did you mean when you said gene mark is trained on self versus host? Oh, okay. So after it um, looks at that sampling and has a pattern, what does it compare it to? So it can either compare it to itself, right? The biggest genes in the open reading frame, or it could compare it to those four nucleotide patterns to a host. And so it's comparing those um, patterns to what, you know, in the case of the mycobacteria to what SMEG does, or like more interestingly to what TB uses and does do those patterns fit that particular open reading frame? And could that likely be a gene? And when you do that, you'll find that some of your things actually go to function. So that gives you more um, confidence that the bias that this introduces um, is legitimate. Um, and it breaks down the smaller the gene gets. And so then you have to evaluate. And, that evaluation is why we do what we do, because if we could program it and say they all have to follow the same degree of bias, 
I'm pretty sure programmers could write that code. The problem is there's these 15 factors and they're not equally weighted across all the decision making. And so you have to evaluate that and you have to keep yourself in check that you're not introducing any more bias or that as a program with thousands of annotators out there, because that's what CFages is, that we're all looking at stuff from the same bias. And if we choose to change our bias, we do what scientists do. We document it and we make the claim, provide our data. And tomorrow we could change what we do because the data is better. And I, I think that's part of why I love this whole arena is um, the concept of right and wrong is absent. It's just the best you can do on any given day. And the more you know, the better you are at it. And um, when you were a child, didn't you have like reading books where you didn't have to read a certain thing? It was like you read at your own pace. That's sort of what all this is like. It's what science is. It's how good you are and how far you want to go with it and what makes sense. And if you want to start making claims, you have to be able to support it. And if you can support it, then as a scientist, you write it down, present it to other scientists, and they're either going to tell you you're full of bananas or this is sound scientific um, protocol. And we'll, we'll advance the field by doing that. And so we're at the beginning of it, even though there's thousands of phages, there's still how many more we haven't touched and we don't know. And it makes it so exciting. Um, and I know how to say, oh, I see what you're saying. I can now do that better. I was going to say as a woman, I could apologize for not doing as well as I could a minute ago, but I'm trying to teach myself not to apologize for things like that I didn't know I did wrong. Is that good? Great. Think... We're getting all the life lessons all in one. <laughs> all in one, right. Oh, there's so many good lessons about life in phages. Yes. Um, it's true. Another of my favorite, I'm going to give you one more is when students like find their phages, you know, they find a plaque. That's so exciting when they find their first plaques and then they like purify it and they amplify it. But it's sort of like pregnancy, right? That when they go to the electron microscope and see the actual particle for the first time, they know a lot about the phage. They've seen it. They've seen how they've been tortured by it and all kinds of things, but it's really sweet when they see that particle for the first time. And <laughs> sort of like birth, just this is a little bit. And naming it is just like naming a kid, you know, like, um, so there's, phages are life. Let's just leave it at that and we're happy. Love it. Ermine, I see you reappear. Did you want to say something or? Yeah, so, I mean, I think it's we are close to, we have several, several more questions. So how long can we go on now? Is there, Debbie, you have to tell us how much time do we have? Um, how about we stop at 9.30? So a couple more, a couple more minutes and um, yeah, the weather's really bad here. So I have to sit tight. So I'm, <laughs> I'm stuck. So that's good. Then in that case, we can take Jessica. I think you can go ahead. Okay. I'll ask a few more. Um, okay. Why are genes of phages in the opposite directions and what's the benefit of that? Um, you'd have to ask the phage, I think is the quick answer to that. Um, because... Uh, DNA is DNA. I, I don't, the, there's no good answer. Um, it, it's how the DNA stacks up and where it goes. Um, you probably, it's probably useless to, um, for, a, for a phage genome to try to make phage particles if it can't really, you know, first it has to get in there and take over the genome. Um, it has to do battle with the bacteria. And so there's going to be um, promoters and ways for it to um, get in there and work in the genome. And you have to remember the phage doesn't care whether it's forward or backwards. Like it, it just doesn't matter. Um, it's just what we've seen. There's a lot of patterns that we see and a very common one is all of um, the, the, there's two promoters actually at both ends of the genome and one's all the forward genes with all the structure and one's all the takeover genes 
Um, and then those transcripts would meet in the middle. Um, I don't know. I've seen genomes that are all forward. Um, it is unlikely I will see a genome that's all reverse because by convention, we put the terminase and the forward gene or the um, structural genes in the forward direction because they were the first studied and they always like studied them that way. So the convention is know that there's a lot of people out there that send their sequencing to a, a service and then whatever comes back, they accept. Um, in phage genomics, that's not a good idea. You should always orient your phage to its ends if it has them. And if it doesn't, we um, pick an arbitrary start as close to the terminase as we can, considering that most terminases have a small terminase subunit ahead of them. And then we try really hard not to cut a genome so that the, there's a gene that crosses the ends. We're not always successful. Um, mostly because after we cut it, we learned something. Um, but GenBank doesn't accept genes that cross the ends very well. And so you like argue with them a little bit more than you have to. So we look for a gap upstream and terminase for those genomes that are circularly permuted. Um, and it doesn't work if there's an overhang. Um, and so there's really defined ends and there's a gene that crosses the defined ends. Like it is, that is what it is. Um, but those are the kind of the things that we think about when we're trying to orient them. There's nothing, there's no harm in, um, to the phage if you orient your phage sequence like unconventionally, like you'll get to all the right genes, but if you wanna compare it and compare it easily so that your brain can process the data easily, um, follow the conventions. Um, and I really did just review a paper recently where the sequencer, they, they purchased their sequence and the sequencer actually assembled it incorrectly. Um, so there was a gene that was in the right orientation and then the next gene was, the next part of the DNA was all backwards. And I'm like, uh, if I wouldn't have had comparative genomics, I might not have picked that up. And it isn't that it couldn't happen, but very unlikely that it did. And so it, whatever sequence you look at, you have to look at it holistically. And we tend to drill down and try to look at genes independently. And we always have to remember to pull back and get the context um, of, of the genome. Um, we just submitted a paper, it's almost ready to come out where we've looked at the prophages of the obsessive phages that we have been working with. Um, and really looked at um, the attachment sites of these, um, of these processes and where they go and how these phages are a whole new subset of mycobacteria phages. Like they're really different. And um, what are they doing to contribute to the pathogenicity? Um, and those are awesome questions out there. And there's a lot of bacteria sequenced. Um, and if we could find um, good software that could find the prophages in the bacterial genomes that are already sequenced, um, we would get another good look at another whole component of, um, of the phages that are in our world. Wow, thank you so much. Maybe one last little question because it came up in a couple of versions. Um, how do you use DNA master or primerator of phages that are not included in a phage database? Um, so the phage database really is the glue that holds us all together. Um, Famerator, um, let's start with DNA master, actually has a genome manager. So you could actually manage your uh, a small sub, you can manage the whole thing um, in DNA master. Um, and then you would see where you want a database to be built around it. Famerator is um, available to any subset of phages um, that anyone wants to do. You just go to famerator.org and there's a contact form there and tell them what you want. and. Um, he'll actually get you started of your own database. Um, it, there's no point at this stage of the game to start 
putting, you know, mixing and matching the phages because the data sets are so big and, um, and wild um, and they're not as comparable as a phage should be a phage, but they're also different and it's so cool. Um, so there's, so DNA masters portable, it's whatever you do with it. Famorator is available to you. I think every software program we've written for what we do is actually is freeware. Um, but you know, it's all written by lots of different people managed and you, you just have to have the right managers and, and how to get that data going. Um, um, and so that, that's the trick, right? Is yeah, we still need to be able to do this, um, you know, in our own house kind of thing. Got it. Well, that's we're at 9 30 or 6 30, depending on where everyone is. But thank you so much, Deborah. And yeah, we're so happy to have you here for our first of this new series. And we're going to make your uh, materials available. So join our Slack channel, phage.directory slash Slack. We have a phage bioinformatics channel set up in there. And Deborah, I don't know if you're a Slack person, but you can also join and people might have more questions there, or I can also share the other questions with you. The chat log I usually share with speakers. So. Um, okay, great. That would be great. Yeah. Um, Ermi, did you want to say anything else? Yeah. Oh, I want to thank Debbie a lot, very much for the presentation, for sharing your slides. And uh, I hope that the questions which are not taken here uh, because of the lack of time, uh, so then the community can discuss among themselves. And if after, after that also, if some questions remain answer, unanswered, then maybe we can send your way. Would that be okay. okay? Sure, I'd be happy. I'm willing to answer any questions that I can. And um, it was a pleasure to be able to share what we do here. Yeah, it is thank exciting. you so much. Wonderful. Very, very nice. <laughs> thank you so much. We really you are have welcome. Time. And as you can see on the chat, a lot of people are thanking you profusely for a wonderful right. talk. So yeah. Very well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and good luck with your series. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so I okay. Yeah. So I think we can close. Yeah. This part. Go ahead and close. Thank you all the participants also for excellent questions and for being here. Uh, very good attendance we had. And so yeah. Thank you all very much for joining. Bye. Bye-bye.